La La Land is one of the most beautiful examples I've ever seen of the message of following your dreams combined with the harsh reality of how difficult that actually is. Take the opening scene for example. The film opens with a song and dance number in the middle of a traffic jam in Los Angeles. The song, Another Day of Sun, is this lively and inspiring number about how everyone moved from their hometowns to Los Angeles in the hopes of making it big in show business. It, called me to be on that screen. it does a wonderful job of filling the viewer with hope and excitement at the idea that the world is these people's oyster as we see them sing, dance, and cheer each other on. Sure, they know that following their dreams will be difficult, but surely in that fairy tale rags to riches way. You know, the kind you see in the movies where the underdog sacrifices a lot? He was sweet and it was true. And it might seem like the world's against them and that everyone thinks they're crazy for taking such a huge risk. Could be brave or just insane. We'll have to see. But still they can do it if they put their hearts into it, right? They've just gotta believe in themselves. They've just gotta believe. The song ends with a big crescendo as all the drivers get ready for another magical pursuit of their dreams. Or as they put it. It's another day of sun. And then the scene keeps going. And you suddenly realize that, as promising as all that sounds, this is what it entails. Sitting in a traffic jam every day while they wait for a big break that may or may not ever even come. But I mean, hey, it's still LA. Even if they haven't caught up with their ambitions yet, at least they're in for another literal day of sun with this beautiful summer weather. Oh. It's winter. In fact, it's Christmas and you wouldn't even know. I guess you can just add that to the list of things these people have given up. You see what I mean about this movie's balance of optimism and realism? Five minutes in, before we've even been given any plot or characters, the film has already set the mood perfectly. But with all that said, let's actually talk about said plot and characters. Okay. The main protagonists are aspiring actress Mia and struggling jazz pianist Seb, and the film wastes no time making you sympathize with them, demonstrating how soul-crushing it is trying and failing to get their careers off the ground on a daily basis. From Mia's perspective, her entire life revolves around a world of acting that she can never seem to break into. Despite clearly having talent, she's stuck fraternizing with self-centered and sleazy Hollywood types, working as a barista on the Warner Brothers lot where she can see the industry but not enter it, and pouring her heart and soul into auditioning for people who couldn't give less of a shit about her. Two options. You either follow my rules or follow my rules. Capisce? Thank you. And Seb isn't very much better. Again, despite clearly having talent, he's a jazz musician in an age where there isn't much demand. So there he is, barely getting by financially by taking pianist jobs where he isn't challenged, inspired, or appreciated. <laughs> With all that in mind, it makes sense why these two would get together. They're both people with lofty ambitions and a real passion for what they do, even if they're stuck in an apathetic world. And the transition to them loving each other is handled pretty naturally. They go from mildly disliking each other due to some fairly inconsequential road rage, to Mia realizing in this scene they may actually have something in common. Up until this point, Seb has been told over and over again by his sister, his boss, by the world around him that he'll never have a jazz career because no one else cares about it. Unpaid bills are not romantic. I don't want to hear the free jazz. How are you going to save jazz if no one's listening? You're fired. What, what planet are you from? Not that fucking tempo! After all that pushback, Seb finally can't take it anymore and lets out all his frustrations in this really impressive piano number which goes from this somber tone as he laments the slow, ongoing death of the music he loves. to this slick and energetic melody where he flexes what both he and Jazz are capable of, proving their worth. <laughs> Mia hears him play, and despite him not saying a word, she knows exactly how he feels. And from then on, they learn to love each other because they finally met another artistically driven person who gets what they're going through. Honestly, that scene is also an example of one of the film's best qualities. That being its ability to tell the story visually without any dialogue. Some examples being Seb's introduction to the audience where we see him driving an older model of car and listening to jazz via cassette tape, which tells the audience right away that he has a fondness for the classics and doesn't partake in modern culture. Or this scene where he and Mia part ways for the evening and they both at separate points look back at each other longingly. But the best tools that the movie has going for it in terms of telling the story visually are Ryan Gosling and especially Emma Stone's performances. There are a lot of 
scenes where they have little to no dialogue and a lot of other scenes where they have a ton of it, but in almost every scene their performances are filled with little quirks and idiosyncrasies that let you know exactly what's going on in their heads. Their conversations also feel incredibly realistic. It's not just he says a line, then she says a line, then he says a line, with all of it delivered with their outward emotions directly reflecting the dialogue. They talk over each other, they stutter and repeat themselves, they pause mid-sentence as they think about what they're trying to say, and they often try to hide how overwhelmed they are. You're gonna be call. quiet, you have to make some goddamn sense. Police. You tell me why they're you're gonna not. And they're, and they're like me, but prettier. No, maybe I'm not. Yes, you are. Maybe I'm not. You are. Maybe I'm not. You are. Admittedly, the two of them are better actors than singers. They both have slightly limited vocal ranges, but neither of them sound bad. They both maintain the melodies of the songs well enough. Plus, Seb sticks to the piano throughout most of the movie, so Brian Gosling's songs aren't particularly demanding from a singing perspective. And Emma Stone still manages to honestly sound great because of the melancholy hopefulness and enthusiasm she puts into her songs. The painters and poets and play. One of the biggest advantages of having two protagonists is that we get to see the theme of not giving up on your dreams from two different perspectives as they both face their own challenges. Seb, for example, is laser focused on trying to open a jazz club at the beginning of the movie, despite the fact that he's not in the most financially stable position and starting your own business always has the chance of failing. It's when he's in a serious relationship with Mia that he starts to feel obligated to get a steady job, even if it means giving up on his club permanently. He decides to become a pianist for a jazz band led by Keith, played by John legend. Trouble is that despite making a living off his new job, he hates the music he's playing. Side note, I like that the movie doesn't portray Keith as this bad guy or incompetent hack who just doesn't get jazz. You could argue his point that jazz wouldn't appeal to a modern audience is a little misguided. Where are the kids? Where are the young people? But at his court, he's a talented artist, same as Seb, but just has his own style that simply isn't to Seb's taste. Plus, you can't exactly get mad at the guy because, sure, Seb might not be into it, but Start a Fire honestly slaps. We can start But at this point, Seb seems to have just reluctantly accepted what he feels is his lot in life. But when he makes Mia aware that he's giving up his dream to make art that he hates, she's horrified and clearly disappointed in how he's throwing away everything he's ever wanted. And while he doesn't want to admit it, he's clearly ashamed of himself. Just look at how in denial he is throughout the conversation. I don't know what what it matters. I don't know what, what are you doing No, right if now? you were happy. Why are you doing this? I don't- You said yourself no one wants to go to that club. He pretends he doesn't care, he gets defensive, he acts like his club was a dumb idea in the first place, he barely even has the courage to look her in the eye. When all else fails, he even resorts to lashing out and insulting her because he can't bear to face what his career has become. Maybe you just liked me when I was on my ass because it made you feel better about yourself. But after some time has passed, that argument ends up being a wake-up call to Seb as he thinks about the music that he used to play and realizes just how unhappy he is. So he leaves the band to continue pursuing his club, getting a steady job that he actually seems to get some enjoyment out of in the meantime. And while all this is going on, we also get to see Mia going through her own arc of doubt and then ultimately believing in herself. After years of being rejected from acting jobs by people who won't give her a fair chance, she decides to take matters into her own hands by writing a one-woman show for herself. She puts everything she has into it, her time, her money, she even quits her job to focus on it. And yet, despite everything, it doesn't seem like it worked out. Barely anyone showed up, and it doesn't seem like word about her is going to spread. This was her last ditch attempt, and it's apparently failed miserably, breaking her heart and making her decide to quit acting. But things start to look up when it turns out a casting director saw the show and wants her to audition for an upcoming movie. Look, there she is! But after everything she's been through, she can't bring herself to do another audition. That is until Seb finds out that she's throwing away her big break when it's staring her right in the face. Sound familiar? Why aren't you starting your club? This is honestly the defining moment for why Mia and Seb's relationship works. Mia saves Seb from resigning to a job that he hates, and then he in turn saves her from losing the biggest opportunity of her life. Not to mention the fact that her audition ends up being a little different from her previous ones. Instead of reading lines for casting directors who've already made up their minds about her before she's even begun, she's instead asked to just tell a story to people who genuinely want to know what she's capable of. We're gonna build the character around the actress. And so Mia 
sings The Fools Who Dream, a personal song about her aunt who inspired her to become an actress and the prospect of how accomplishing her dreams is so important to her that she'll endure all the hardships and pain that it takes. And wouldn't you know it, when she puts herself out there for people who are willing to take a chance on her and actually have inspired and unique ideas of their own, she gets the part. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Mia and Seb realize that they can't maintain a steady relationship and still keep their goals compatible. Mia's career will take her all over the world and Seb can't exactly take his jazz club along for the ride. So they break up. Five years pass and they've both seemingly moved on. Seb has built up a successful club and Mia a successful acting career and a husband and daughter. But they run into each other when Mia just happens to find his club, which she recognizes from the name and logo which she came up with. What's interesting is that he was initially reluctant to use them. Because no one's gonna come to chicken on a stick. It's gotta be chicken on a stick. <laughs> it would seem that after she convinced him not to give up on the club, he decided to dedicate his passion project to her. And then we get the best example of visual storytelling in the entire entire movie. Mia and Seb never say a word to each other as they see each other again. Nobody in the room is even given the slightest hint that these two know each other, but they're both clearly a little shook. So shook in fact that they have a 5 minute fantasy montage where they think about what could have been had they been able to stay together. And they fantasize about fixing all their regrets. What if their relationship didn't have a rocky start? What if Seb didn't settle for a band he didn't care about? What if Mia's hopes and dreams didn't temporarily crash and burn? And most importantly, what if they didn't have to choose between their relationship and their dreams? It's easy to look at people who have achieved every goal they set out for themselves and think they have it all. But even the luckiest or most talented of us have mistakes that they wish they could take back or even just wish they could have their cake and eat it too. And a lot of it is portrayed in these exaggerated, painted film set versions of Los Angeles and Paris which helps to contrast with the real life LA portrayed in the rest of the film and emphasizes this being their idealized dream version of how things played out. But that art style also gets contrasted as they trade the larger than life Hollywood sets for some fuzzy home movies on a projector. It's a good metaphor for how the two of them wish they could have balanced the glamorous lives of performers with simple home life raising a family. Hell, there's even the implication that Mia was somewhat hoping for a son instead of a daughter. It just goes to show that even in the parts of your life where you do get what you want, it won't always be exactly how you envisioned it. That doesn't make it disappointing as Mia still clearly loves her little girl, but it's just how life sometimes plays out. The film ends with Mia and her husband leaving Seb with his club. The two still don't say a word to each other, but they share one final look from across the room. They reflect on how their lives have turned out and how things might have been different in a perfect world, but in the end, all they can do is smile at each other. As if to say, we did it. Yeah, we did. And they part ways, happy with the choices they made and knowing that they couldn't have done it without each other. Watching that ending, I can't help but think back to that opening scene. I mentioned before how it juxtaposes the traditional romanticized story of an underdog performer overcoming adversity and making it big by showing just how hard it can really be. But then when you watch the movie all the way through, the ending ultimately proves the song right. If you want to accomplish your dreams, there will be sacrifices, there will be hardship, and you will doubt yourself. But as the song insists, it's worth it. And you realize that as Mia and Seb choose not to fret their losses because they know that what the future holds for them is another day of sun. It's another day of sun. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, then be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon to get notified for more videos. And be sure to check out my last video on the Muppet Christmas Carol. With the full cut of the movie finally available again, it's worth looking into how it fares as a whole.